make our choices. And those choices, they put us on a road. Sometimes those choices seem small, but they put you on the road. You think about getting off, but eventually you're back on it. And the road has good choices and it has bad choices. This is a bad choice road. Bad choices lead to bad roads that lead to bad places. Hey guys, Kiwi here, warning you spoilers for Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul. In this video, I'll be breaking down Kim's dream job, how the idea came to fruition in the first place, along with the ethical versus unethical methods that she chooses to try and accomplish it. Like the video if you end up enjoying it, subscribe to the channel, and follow me on Twitter for more Better Call Saul and Breaking Bad content. With that being said, let's jump into the breakdown. So although we'll be discussing recent events that happened during Season 6, in order to start this breakdown, we need to take it all the way back to the origins of Kim's emotions motives way back in Season 3. So at the end of Season 2 and beginning of Season 3, Kim said to Mesa Verde that they were going to be her only focus, but she slowly started realizing how overworking herself for Mesa Verde wasn't satisfying herself the way that she thought the success would. Having Mesa Verde as my sole client will take up the entirety of my attention, to be sure. But if this were beyond my abilities, I wouldn't be throwing my hat in the ring. I would not waste your time. Or mine. During season 3, Kim was overworking herself, but she was blind to it all season. Her car crash at the end of season 3 gave her the realization that overworking herself is not healthy, and that it's obviously not worth her life. By the end of season 3, Kim was clearly traumatized by the fact that she could have died in the car crash. She was wondering what she was doing it all for, and realized that it wasn't worth it. So after the car crash and going into season 4, Kim finally came to accept the realization that overworking herself from Mesa Verde wasn't fulfilling, along with thinking about what truly made her happy. Normally, Kim is very hands-on, and when she puts her mind to something, nothing can get in her way. As we saw during Season 2 and Season 3, Kim always did everything herself, going above and beyond for Mesa Verde. As far as I'm concerned, she's proven she can feel whatever we throw at her, and then some. Kevin, your faith in me, is, it's, it means a lot. As time went on and Kim had the realization that she was overworking herself, she started pushing back on Mesa Verde work. Near the end of 310, Kim talks to Jimmy about a movie, To Kill a Mockingbird. It was my favorite when I was a kid. I loved Atticus Finch. No, I wanted to be him. Fight the good fight, change the world. Oh, yeah, yeah. I am. I'm changing the world by helping a mid-sized local bank become a mid-sized regional bank. Yay me. Kim sarcastically jokes, implying how she's not doing anything to truly help people that are in need. In episode 404, Kim started lurking in the courtroom of a judge who gave her a hard time for doing so instead of focusing on Mesa Verde and told her that Next time I see you lurking in my court, I'm gonna put you to work. Understood. During his next hearing, he saw Kim back in her courtroom, which was a smart-ass way of Kim implying that she really did want pro bono work. So in season 4, Kim started doing the pro bono work, which she found her true passion. This is because even though Mesa Verde was making her tons of money, she felt hollow helping a bank with its expansions. With pro bono work, Kim felt like she was actually helping people who truly needed it, but weren't normally able to get the help that they needed. Kim also proved to be really good at working pro bono cases, along with being even better than Jimmy at wheeling and dealing plea deals with Bill Oakley. Are you joking? And we started at 18 months jail. Up to you. Eight months jail. Four months probation. But what happened to six? You're annoying me. You don't have time for this. I only have one other client, and it's a bank. I have all the time in the world. During 406, when Kim tells Jimmy about how she took up the Schweikart job in order to have more spare time working pro bono, we get her explanation for why she's made this decision. I like it. I'm good at it. And I'm helping people. Jimmy, and I know that sounds cheesy, it's, you know, it's whatever, but it's the truth. Usually Kim would do everything herself, but as she became less motivated and passionate to work for Mesa Verde, she started offloading her work on not only her new paralegal Viola, she eventually created a new banking division at Schweikart in order to have more spare time to herself and her pro bono clients. If I go to Schweikart and Coakley, I have all those associates to help cover Mesa Verde. It'll keep paying the bills and free me up to do the work I really care about. I oh, see so you kind of get to have your cake and eat it too. Kind of, yeah. So not only was she setting up others to do her work for her, she was also sidelining Paige and Mesa Verde during situations where they needed her. In 404, she shuts Paige down for a pro bono client and gets flack for it afterwards. When we first started working together, I promised you Mesa Verde would be my sole focus. And I meant it. You made us a promise that Mesa Verde would be your sole focus. When we need you, we need you. In 408, she denies pushing for a bigger bank expansion, even though she knows that she could get it done if she put her mind to it. <sighs> Kevin, I'm sorry, but I have to agree with Paige. 
Going into Season 5, Kim continues to push away Mesa Verde work in preference of her pro bono work, and in 503 even gets a talking to from Rich due to it. Not now, Steph. I wouldn't bother with it, but... I asked you to handle it. We are, but there's just... Steph, this is not the time. It's not like you're in the middle of a murder trial. Rich, this, this is just Kevin being Kevin. Now, don't get me wrong, I respect your devotion to your pro bono clients. But Mesa Verde keeps the lights on. Can we agree on that? Eventually, by the end of Season 5, Kim ended up quitting Mesa Verde and Schweikart entirely in order to take on more pro bono clients and do what she truly loves. In 509, during Kim's final day at Schweikart, she looks at all her Mesa Verde trophies that she's acquired through all the bank expansions that she's helped with, but then she stares at a framed photo of her with one of her pro bono clients, implying how that's the true trophy that she really values above all the work that she's done at Mesa Verde. Kim almost dying in the car crash at the end of Season 3, along with Jimmy almost dying in the desert in Season 5 has pushed her to do what she truly loves doing, as she wants to value her life doing something fruitful since she never knows when her or her loved ones will get their ticket punched. I thought you were dead, so that was, um, oh, that helped me to see what's important what isn't. The two things that Kim really loves to do are help pro bono clients and con with Jimmy. During season 5, we see those two separate lifestyles clash and merge into one. The thing is, throughout the seasons, Kim's love to con and scheme with Jimmy grew as much as her love to do pro bono work. In season 4, we saw Kim staring at the Zephyro and Yeho bottle stopper from her first con with Jimmy in the season 2 premiere, and by the time she quits near the end of season 5, the bottle stopper is the only thing that she takes home with her. Previously, Kim would just do fun, but relatively harmless cons with Jimmy such as bar tricks and such, but now she's starting to use cons in a more serious manner by incorporating it into her career. We did get a glimpse of this with them scheming against Chuck in Season 3, or even Help Hewell in Season 4, but it was always something to benefit Jimmy's story and not necessarily Kim's. At the end of Season 4, they did the blueprint con to help Mesa Verde, which was one of the first cons used to benefit Kim, and also showed huge foreshadowing on what was to come next. During 501, Kim was reluctant to do Jimmy's plan to con her unappreciative client into taking a plea deal, but she ends up doing it anyways, which was entirely her own decision. It was a line that Kim didn't want to cross, but she crossed it anyways when she realized that she had no other option. In 502, Kim told Jimmy that she didn't want to con her clients because it felt wrong tricking and manipulating the very people that she was trying to help, even if in the end it was for their own good. Kim, however, turns to conning her main client, Mesa Verde, through Mr. Acker. This is because even though Mr. Acker was rude to her, she eventually put aside that and felt bad for him as he was the quote unquote little guy in the situation who's the type of person that Kim wants to help. She got Jimmy to fight against Mesa Verde by constantly conning them in Mr. Acker's favor. She did this even though she took personal offense to Mr. Acker calling her out during the first confrontation since he wasn't entirely wrong. Don't think that you are the first to try to rediscover their love of the law by trolling my court here not. Best thing you can do is stick to Mesa Verde. Make lots of money. Give some to charity. You're one of those people that uh, give a little money to charity every month so you can make up for all the bad that you've done. Oh, I don't know how in the world you sleep at night. It was rude for him to assume what type of person she is, implying how she's a corporate shell who just donates to charity to make herself feel better about what she's done. Kim is more self-aware than that, and knows that she'd rather actually try to make a difference helping people instead of just working for a bank. Kim has felt hollow helping Mesa Verde with their bank expansions, so she took to pro bono work to give herself that warm feeling of actually helping people. Kim actually surprisingly warmed up to Mr. Acker after their second confrontation and wanted to genuinely make a difference, so she put Jimmy up to it as a final resort, and then when that didn't work, Jimmy lured her into taking the nuclear option, which she pressed to do even though Jimmy advised against it. There's always another play, but the rational thing to do here is close the deal, get the guy a few bucks, pop the champagne with the other winners, smile like you mean it. Or, in reality, Jimmy may have manipulated her into doing the nuclear option that he dangled in front of her, using reverse psychology by telling her about it just to tell her to not do it, when he knew that she would once she found out that it was even an option, just like with her client in 501. There's no reason on God's green earth to take this any further. It's not worth it. Or? Or... We go after Kevin Wachtel. It's nasty, it's personal, it gets dangerous. Even though Mr. Acker was rude to her, she wanted to prove him wrong and in a way herself as well by helping him as he's the quote unquote little guy in the situation, even after the way that he treated her. Although Kevin and Paige at Mesa Verde were blind of what Jimmy and Kim were doing, Rich is perceptive enough to figure out their true plans and confronts Kim on it in 505. I'm thinking you could take a break from Mesa Verde. 
And of course, this goes without saying, this won't affect any of your compensation. And that includes your bonus. You know, Mesa Verde is fully informed of any potential conflicts. Kevin signed off himself. Rich suggests that Kim should step down from working with Mesa Verde as he can tell that she doesn't have her heart in it anymore since he could tell that she set Jimmy up to be opposing counsel, which was affecting her dealings with Mesa Verde and compromised her objectivity. I don't understand where this is coming from. Don't you? Kim, sometimes the less said the better. And why is that? Do we have to? Yes, we do. Kim angrily denies this, causing a public scene at their office. This was Kim in denial of what she knew to be the truth, and even if she wasn't in denial, she didn't like being called out for it. I told you, I explained the situation to Kevin and Paige. Yeah, I know you did. And I'm sorry to say, I'm just not buying it. That, along with the fact that she always has to make decisions herself, caused her to become insulted that Rich suggested that she should step down. It's not until the end of the season, when she has come to the realization of the truth herself, that she actually goes ahead and does so, which results in her not only stepping down from Mesa Verde, but quitting Schweikart as a whole. This is partly due to Kim's plans, with Jimmy working for Mr. Acker blowing up in her face during 506, due to Jimmy going against her wishes to slander Kevin's father. Yep. Hi, I'm Saul Goodman. Resulting in her deciding to marry Jimmy so that they'll always be on the same page and that they'll be unable to be forced to testify against each other. Kim has learned time and time again that Jimmy will scheme and take shortcuts whenever he can and that he'll even lie to her about the means as long as he gets their desired outcome. Fuck you, Jimmy. There's many reasons why Kim quit her job along with why she may have agreed to marry Jimmy instead of breaking up with him in season five, but one of them is to try and take control of their dynamic to create a united front so that situations will never blow up in her face again. Kim is accepting the fact of who Jimmy is, and is now realizing how powerful their conning abilities truly are to get whatever they want, no matter the cost. Even though she didn't want to go through with the nuclear option, Jimmy did it anyways, and it got their desired outcome, corrupting her into believing that the ends justify the means. Now, I may have gotten a little sidetracked with all this stuff about Mr. Acker, but it's an important role that plays in the progression of Kim's character, as it shows how Kim is continuing to incorporate conning and scheming into her life, along with her actual career. This of course led up to Kim wanting to quit Mesa Verde entirely and instead focus fully on pro bono clients. Then I spent the afternoon in the courthouse with pro bono clients without Mesa Verde hanging over my head. Best afternoon I've had in a long time along with conning with Jimmy in order to accomplish her new goal of one day opening a pro bono practice. In 510, when Howard is introducing Kim to his associates, she drops a huge bomb on him that she quit Schweikart and Mesa Verde. Howard, understandably concerned, takes Kim aside as he's worried that she's making a terrible mistake. Howard confides in Kim about Jimmy messing with him, along with implying that Jimmy may have had something to do with Kim quitting her job. Although Jimmy has corrupted Kim like Howard thinks, it's not in the way that Howard thinks. Kim did make the decision on her own to quit her job and is offended that Howard would think otherwise. When Kim confronts Jimmy about Howard told her that Jimmy was messing with him, instead of getting mad at Jimmy for doing so, she uses Howard belittling her as an excuse to want to further mess with him. However, the reality is, the fact that she wants to mess with Howard in order to force Sandpiper to settle so they can get Jimmy's share of the common fund. Hey, pro bono is wonderful. It is, but pro bono means no money. So what's the plan here? I don't know, but I'll figure it out. Okay. We never do it. What if Howard does something terrible? You know what that'd mean for the Sandpiper case? A big class action suit? They could tank the whole thing. And the lawyers get paid. And the lawyers get paid. We then get Kim's justification for wanting to tear down Howard for the Sandpiper money. I'd rent the smallest, shittiest office I could find near the courthouse and open a pro bono practice give regular people the kind of representation usually only millionaires get. This is very Robin Hood-esque of her, wanting to tear down the rich to give to the poor, but she doesn't realize the true consequences of her actions and what they'll cause, even though Jimmy tries to warn her. We're not talking about a bar trick here. We're talking about scorched earth. We would have to hurt him, hurt him bad. To get a bunch of lawyers to run for the exits, Howard would have to have done something unforgivable. At the end of it, he might never be able to practice law again. She's now taking an ends justify the means approach, something that she's now learned to accept after seeing Jimmy use that morale time and time again. Initially, Kim disagreed with this philosophy, but throughout her many experiences with Jimmy, she's learned to embrace it to the point that now even Jimmy is surprised with what she's willing to do. During 510, when Kim is at the courthouse to pick up more pro bono cases, she's overwhelmed with just how many cases are pending, with there being more that she or any other public defender could handle or reasonably catch up on. This could have been partly what motivated Kim to start up a pro bono practice in order to tackle the huge overflow of pending cases. At the beginning of the episode, Jimmy asked Kim if he was bad for her. Kim denied it, even though it was the truth. Am I bad for you? 
are you bad for me? Jimmy has awakened something inside of Kim that he didn't even know existed, which is the fact that Kim has known how to con since childhood due to growing up alongside her mother, who was a con artist herself, as we saw in the 606 cold open flashback. He is bad for Kim, but it is her own fault. She keeps letting him back in, and some part of her that we don't know, which is her past, it's clear that she even finds it familiar. That clip was from behind the scenes of Bob Odenkirk talking about the dynamic between Jimmy and Kim for the season 5 finale, which was obviously before season 6 aired, so we didn't yet know what her past was, but then in season 6 we found out that it was her mom who was a con artist. So even though Jimmy is reluctant to go along with it, Kim now has a clear goal to accomplish her dream job. She wants to force Sam Piper to settle in order to be able to fund a pro bono practice, even if it results in tearing Howard down in the process. Kim doing this, it's not you. You would not be okay with it. Not in the cold light of day. Wouldn't I? And of course she keeps denying to herself the truth of what it'll do to Howard, downplaying it, saying that it'll just bruise him or that he'll stand back up and get on his feet, not realizing how it'll permanently scar Howard in his career and eventually cost him his life. We're talking about a career setback. A career setback for one lawyer. Yeah, I know you could help a lot of people. I, I get it, but uh, there's really no need to... A career setback. In 601, Kim pushes Jimmy to work on the Sandpiper scheme with her. Even though he seems reluctant, he goes along with it as he doesn't want to upset her and can't turn down a good con. I was thinking about our first move on the Howard front. We're doing that? I thought we were. Aren't we? You think we shouldn't? Well, I, I didn't say that. Well, what's the harm in listening? Throughout the first half of the season, they do various elaborate cons to ruin Howard's reputation, but then in 604, while in the middle of one, she starts talking to Cliff about her dream to start up a pro bono practice, and he actually bites. What if there was an independent team of lawyers, maybe four or five of them, who were dedicated to taking on the difficult cases? Kim, the firm has a service committee. I should tell you to go to them and get in line with all the other worthy causes. Kim, I think you've got something here. Then in 606, Cliff confronts Kim to follow up on it. Cliff mentions a foundation that funds justice reform programs on the East Coast and tells her that they're expanding West. Cliff offers her an opportunity to meet some of the foundation board members to present her pro bono practice ID to them for possible funding. Have you heard of the Jackson Mercer Foundation? Of course, they fund justice reform programs on the East Coast. I wish we had something like that out here. It's a bit hush-hush at the moment, but we will soon. And that's what I want to talk to you about. It's not a done deal. Some of the foundation board members are flying in next week in Santa Fe. They are inviting a select group. Cliff called them up-and-coming organizations. Cliff thinks I have a good shot. So at this point, Kim now has two choices to accomplish her dreams. She could A, ruin Howard's reputation in order to force Sandpiper to settle, or B, take a newly offered legitimate route to genuinely earn her pro bono practice. Normally, Kim would only stoop to conning and scheming when she knew there was no other option, but now she's choosing to con and scheme even though she knows that there's now a legitimate option. And at first, she does try to do both at the same time. The lunch is on D-Day. You don't have to be there on the day. She continues the Sandpiper scheme with Jimmy, while also preparing to go to the Santa Fe meeting that Cliff has set up for her. Victory in Santa Fe, victory in Albuquerque. <laughs> that sounds good. Don't worry about anything except for your pitch, okay? I'll record the whole show and we can listen to it later. But by the end of 606, Kim is given an ultimatum where she must choose one or the other. Will she go to the Santa Fe meeting knowing that they're gonna have to cancel the Mediator Con, or will she abandon the Santa Fe meeting and turn around to salvage the Mediator Con? We're gonna pull the plug, and we are going to live to fight another day. What other day? And we'll figure it out, I promise, okay? Just do your thing in Santa Fe, and we'll regroup when you get home tonight. It happens today. People wondered why Jimmy seeing the mediator at the liquor store with a broken arm was necessary, and this is it. To give Kim this ultimatum, to metaphorically and literally go down Bad Choice Road as the episode ends with her pulling a literal U-turn to miss the Santa Fe meeting in order to make sure the mediation con goes down as planned. And then at the beginning of 607, to prove beyond any doubt that this is Kim's decision, she doubles down on it when Jimmy tells her that she can still make her meeting in Santa Fe. You sure of this? Absolutely sure. We want it to look right, right? Yeah, I know, but I can do it. You get back in the car, bust the speed limit, and you'll still make that lunch. Jimmy, this is where I need to be. Kim implies that she's okay with missing the meeting because she says how this is where she needs to be. So throughout 607, the mediator con goes off successfully, and they get their desired outcome, with Cliff admitting that they will settle the Sandpiper case. We have to settle. Hello, everyone. This is Clifford Main, lead counsel speaking, and I'm here with some good news. 
but by the end of 607, Kim is shown the unintended consequences of her actions by witnessing Howard get killed right in front of her. This was the point of Howard's death, to make Jimmy and mainly Kim realize the unintended consequences of their actions that Kim's been putting blinders on from acknowledging ever since the season 5 finale when her plans to force Sandpiper to settle first came to fruition. A career setback. Kim tries to go about her life after Howard's death and have the quote unquote normal day that Mike told them to have, but clearly the ends don't justify the means for her anymore since she got one of her closest associates of the past decade killed right in front of her. This results in Kim totally uprooting her current life as she just can't bear to live with what they've done. Even though she now has access to the Sandpiper money to start up her pro bono practice, it was at a cost that she never wanted to pay. She quits the law, cementing the fact that she will never help a pro bono client again. And since that's the case, she no longer wants the Sandpiper money that she worked so hard to get. She also breaks up with Jimmy by the end of 609, finally acknowledging how toxic they are for each other and how they've hurt everyone around them. Kim didn't want the Sandpiper money since she never ended up getting a pro bono law practice due to being ashamed of her actions as a lawyer, or in general for that matter. I'd like to now compare Kim Wexler to Walter White by aligning the clear parallels of the choices that these characters have made. Walter White initially started cooking and selling drugs for a somewhat noble reason, to provide for his family after he was gone due to knowing that he wouldn't live much longer. If this were his only option to make such a large amount of money in such a short time, it would have been an idea that most viewers could have gone behind. $737,000, that's what I need. That is what I need. But the thing is, many casual viewers forgot the legitimate opportunity that Walt was offered in Season 1 that would have solved all of his problems without having to get involved with anything illegal. And that's Grey Matter. Now I'm sure all you hardcore Breaking Bad fans clearly remember the offer that Elliot and Gretchen offered to Walt in Season 1, but it was something that casual fans may have not paid much attention to or may have glossed over and forgotten early on before following Walt on his journey. Elliot offered Walt a job at Grey Matter which would have paid for any needs that his family may have had after he was gone. Are you? Uh asking me to come work for you at Grey Matter? Yeah, why not? You, you'd fit right in. You're brilliant. You, you, you got a ton of experience. Well, I... Along with Elliot offering to pay for his cancer treatments. He offered me a job. What? Yes. And then when I turned that down, he flat out offered to pay for my treatment. In this moment, Walt had the ultimatum to either A, solve all of his problems legitimately by accepting the offer, or B, turn to a criminal lifestyle to try and solve his problems on his own. Walt's ego and lifelong resentment of feeling ripped off by Elliot and Gretchen taking his work and thriving off of it caused Walt to turn down their offer and instead solve his financial problems on his own by cooking and selling drugs. In my opinion, the ultimatum that Walt was given in Breaking Bad Season 1 directly parallels the ultimatum that Kim was given in Better Call Saul Season 6. Six. In both scenarios, they were given an ethical and unethical opportunity to get what they wanted, and in each instance, Walt and Kim both decided to go down Bad Choice Road. Okay, what did you say, Walt? What do you think I said? causing them to not only destroy their lives, but resulted in them not even acquiring what they originally set out to accomplish. Walt wanted to cook and sell drugs in order to provide for his family after he's gone, but his ego got to his head and he took things too far, losing his family in the process along with them wanting nothing to do with his dirty money. He also destroyed his life along with many lives around him, including his immediate family and extended family. Walt eventually owned up to the fact that he did what he did because he selfishly enjoyed it, but it was too little too late. And then Kim wanted the sandpiper money in order to fund a pro bono practice, but she had blinders on the whole time she was scheming and conning against Howard and Sandpiper, not thinking about the unintended consequences it would cause. By the end of it, she became so disgusted in what she did that she threw away her opportunity to acquire a dream job by quitting the law, denying the Sandpiper money, and breaking up with Jimmy. During this process, Kim also ruined her own life, along with the lives of many people around her, which she finally admits by the end of it. But we are bad for everyone around us. Other people suffer because of us. Now, unlike Walt, Kim was able to get the hell out of Dodge after coming to yet another self-realization that she wasn't going down the path that she wanted to, but at what cost? The damage was already done, and Kim was forced to live with the result of her actions for the rest of her life. And as Mike told Jesse during El Camino, Put things right. No. Sorry, kid. That's the one thing you can never do. Walt went down Bad Choice Road due to wanting to fuel his selfish ego. I did it for me. I liked it. I was good at it. While Kim did it due to having too much fun conning while not realizing the consequences of her actions until it was too late. He would pull the plug on the scam and then we'd break up. And I didn't want that because I was having too much fun. 
Although Walt and Kim had different motives for deciding to go down Bad Choice Road, the parallel is definitely there, and I appreciate the creator's abilities to tell these stories and show how going down Bad Choice Road affects these separate characters in different ways. So technically, many characters throughout the Breaking Bad Better Call Saul universe go down their own Bad Choice Road, with Walt and Kim just being two of them. However, the ultimatum that they've both been given where they're able to choose between an ethical versus unethical solution to their problems is a clear parallel between these two characters, especially since they both choose the unethical option due to it being more fun, which in both cases results in it blowing up right in their faces. Throughout the Gene timeline, Kim was so traumatized by Howard and the events surrounding it that she went from being the type of person to have initiative to always make her own decisions to never wanting to ever make any decisions on her own. By the end of the show, after handing in her confession about Howard to the Albuquerque courthouse along with Howard's widow Cheryl, Kim finally felt at least enough weight lifted off her shoulders to be able to start making her own decisions again. We see this in the form of Kim going to volunteer at a law practice before being called into Saul Goodman's court hearing. I think that Kim wanted to volunteer at the law practice because even though she's not a lawyer herself anymore, she still wanted to help out people in need in a similar way to the best of her ability. To be honest, it's not much, but it's definitely a start, giving at least some hope for the future of Kim's character being able to continue doing what she always wanted to help clients that are in need of it. So that's my analysis on how Kim built up the realization of what she wanted to do with her life and what she wanted her dream job to be, but then how she destroyed it by going down Bad Choice Road instead of taking the legitimate opportunity that was right in front of her due to having too much fun while making those bad decisions. There's many ways to interpret the complex character that is Kim Wexler, and I'd be more than happy to hear what you thought about her motivations for the decisions that she made in the comments below. This was just a somewhat brief breakdown on Kim's dream job and how she had no one to blame but herself for destroying it, but in the future I may create a full Kim Wexler character spotlight retro perspective where I discuss her full story from start to finish, so also let me know if you want to see that in the comments below, along with any other character arcs or full stories that you may want to see me tackle next. I'd appreciate a like on the video if you've enjoyed anything I've said today. If you're new to the channel or just haven't yet already, subscribe and hit that bell notification to stay updated on when I post new content on Better Call Saul and Breaking Bad. Check out my Patreon or give a super thanks to help support the channel financially, it truly means a lot. But most importantly, I thank you all so much for watching, and until next time, I'll talk to you guys later. Peace out.